Before we begin today, friends, on this day where the theme is one of journeys, I would ask you to hold our older two children in your prayers. They are experiencing a very harrowing travel journey trying to get from Newark, New Jersey to Vancouver and British Columbia. And so I'm already learning that the sermon I wrote for us to share together speaks probably most deeply to me. So we would be grateful if you would keep them in your prayers. Please be seated. He was born in the summer of his 27th year, coming home to a place he'd never been before. He left yesterday behind him. He might say he was born again. You might say he found a key for every door. Now he walks in quiet solitude, the forest and the trees, seeking grace in every step he takes. In the name of God, who is creator, redeemer, and sustainer, amen. In the fall of 1972, a rising young singer and songwriter named John Denver released a song titled Rocky Mountain High on his album of the same name. This song marks Denver's first entry into the coveted top 10 of pop music and played an important role in 1970s culture. In the lyrics, the young Denver speaks of himself in the third person. Only 27 years old, he was overcome by the majesty of the Rocky Mountains during a camping trip and would call Aspen, Colorado home for the rest of his life. Amazed by the beauty of a meteor shower that he witnessed from almost 11,000 feet, Denver wrote the song as a tribute not only to the beauty of the mountains and the peace that flows from being one with nature, but also to the sense of rightness that comes when we find our place in this world and who we are really meant to be. Although his life's journey could be a busy one of music, travel, and environmental activism, his most popular song speaks simply and lovingly of coming home. Rocky Mountain High, in particular, talks to us of what it means to start a new life with the courage to leave one behind, of coming home to a place we've never been before, the feeling of being born anew, and what it means to seek grace with every step we take. In today's gospel, we hear that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. This phrase, which is unique to Luke's gospel, is generally considered to mean that Jesus was resolute and single-minded in purpose, faithful to the journey that would lead him to his destiny. We are given no reason to think that Jesus was in denial about either the journey or what awaited him at the end of it. Jesus knew it would demand all his courage, all his obedience, all his love. We can safely assume that regardless of the difficulties of the journey, a journey which sweeps up all of us who believe as well, Jesus knew his sacrifice on the cross at journey's end would fulfill God's purposes on earth and bring us to a reward worth all the trials, a place in the kingdom of God. We hear of the difficulties and the prize all in one conversation. We are reminded that we too are on this journey to Jerusalem and are invited to join our stories with a larger narrative, finding comfort in the reminder that seeking grace with every step is never easy, yet it lies at the heart of what it means to be faithful. Jesus is not alone in this story and there are disciples on the way who are eager to follow eager to pin down exactly what it means to follow him. Their love is genuine, as in the case of the man who says, I will follow you wherever you go. Their claims to delay the journey are legitimate, and there will always be matters that compete for our attention as well. Jesus' message to them and us 
is that the mission to bring forth God's reign has an urgency to it, that our singleness of purpose as disciples who pledge ourselves to the way of love must be our first priority. Before we go any further, dear ones, make no mistake. This is a story of call. We may be tempted to hear it as a conversation Jesus is having with other people, but in reality, it is also directed at us. We have the privilege again of eavesdropping on a priceless conversation with our Savior, one that holds as true for us as if we were really there on the road with him. Jesus is being honest here, and there are no empty promises, no false guarantees that follow me somehow boasts a life of ease and safety, not for Jesus, nor for us. The man who tells Jesus he will follow him receives a pretty stark answer. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but as for me, the son of man, even I have nowhere to lay my head. Their journey promises them not even a safe night's rest and hours, if we choose to follow Jesus, will not gift us a life free from sacrifice either. If Jesus' earthly life among us included discomfort and difficulty, why would we expect ours to be any different? And just like the disciples in this story, we quickly learn that following Jesus will be far from easy, that there are countless reasons to ask for a deferral, just like jury duty, when we realize we are called to a life of seeking grace with every step we take. It is not easy to say goodbye to an old life and embrace a new one even when you are certain the new one is what you're longing for, and it's even harder when you're not. It takes great courage to set out on a journey when you have no idea what the basics of life along the way will look like, or when you're told up front to accept discomfort or downright hard times as part of your new life. It is not easy to consider what it looks like to say farewell to your family and friends before you begin this new journey, understanding as you do that their goodbye is to the person they thought they knew not the person you will become. We are likely to have some hard to answer questions. Where will I lay my head at night? How will I earn the money I need to survive? What will my family think? Who will my new friends be? What will be demanded of me that I cannot possibly imagine today? And how will that change me? It can seem sometimes so tempting to wait, so much easier to come up with a long list of excuses. Can it wait, Jesus, until my kids are grown and I'm not caring for an elderly parent? I'm in the middle of grieving a lost relationship. How about after I get that settled? Hmm? How about when I retire? Now that, that would be a good time. Or even, I don't quite understand what you're asking of me. How about if you clarify that and I'll get back to you when we figure it out. And I'm joking with you a little bit here for sure, but rare is the person who accepts the call to follow me wholeheartedly and without wondering what it looks like, what happens now, what do I do next? And there are pivotal moments in everyone's life, mountaintop experiences when it all seems wonderfully clear. And just like the man in Luke's story, we cry, I will follow you wherever you go. And there are moments when we turn to follow Jesus as we talk about in our way of love, in big and grand decisions full of joy and triumph. And then there are the thousands of quieter, everyday ones when doing so means choosing to live by the fruits of the Spirit despite all our human frailty and weakness. It means following Jesus when the night has been long and you face a tough day waiting for those updates from the airline to tell you about your flight or when your heart is broken from deeper care or sorrow. 
It means following when other humans are hurtful to you or when your way of life is ridiculed and rejected. It means choosing to follow when your heart's cry is born in the anguish of not knowing anything but the certainty that beside Jesus, walking the road to Jerusalem is where you most long to be and you are just too weary to do anything but rest safely in the arms of the one who promised you the kingdom of heaven. And although Jesus urges us not to, sometimes we do look back, overcome with a longing to see where we've come from, almost irresistibly drawn to pay a visit to our old selves in our old lives. We realize the journey onward means setting our hand to the plow and not looking back, but we are human even when our hearts and souls are truly faithful. We realize the journey ahead means saying goodbye to what is old, that just as Paul teaches us in today's epistle, we are called to the freedom a new life brings, and for freedom Christ has set us free. Journeys are tantalizing things, which is probably why we're so fascinated with them. We read about them in books, we watch them in movies, and we eagerly follow along when other people take them. Just last week, at least 30 members of our diocese, led by Bishop Scanlon and Canon Dan Morrow, embarked on a six-day journey called the Camino, which means highway, along a section of the Appalachian Trail in Pennsylvania. In her Facebook post, Bishop Scanlon shared these thoughts. The Christian life is a journey that evolves and includes surprises, challenges, great blessings, and the deepening of faith as we walk along. I believe that the Christian faith is all about allowing God to transform us. I know there will be lessons on that trail that I cannot imagine, and my first intention is to keep my heart open to receive them. Our bishop understands as does John Denver in that song, that being faithful to the journey has the power of life-altering transformation, that grace can indeed be found with every step we take. An unknown place can be both a physical destination and a place of your heart, a place where embracing the call to follow me seems more real than it ever has before to understand what it really means to come home to a place you've never been before, is to have heard Jesus say, follow me, and to have obeyed, to have found the courage to say yes. Yes, Jesus, I will follow you. Forward into the future you have designed for me, faithful to the journey, faithful to a life I cannot yet see. For the journey is real, and the calling is real, and the presence of God with us and before us is the most real and the most true of all. So as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Amen.